Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce. I'm joined here today with the awesome Tommy Scoville from The Lifeboat. I'm going to show you guys this channel real fast in case you missed our first episode. So if you're not subscribed to Tommy, go ahead and hit that subscribe button for Tommy's channel. I will also be linking our last episode in the description box below, which Tommy, I got overwhelming, such overwhelming love. Um, from that that episode, people were so touched by your story, um, your story of resilience and and all that that stuff that you learned along your journey as a human being and the refining of of you being human and and all that stuff, guys. And so this is going to be a different type of episode. But but if you miss that right. episode, <laughs> Tommy, please check it out because we're actually you know. But this is this is an important episode for lots of of reasons because. I, I don't know about you, Tommy, but I do have a belief a belief in God. I'm not religious, but I do have a belief in a higher power. And sometimes there's a mysterious workings within that higher power. And sometimes divinity puts us in places with certain people and we don't know why, but then all of a sudden we know why. And and this is you 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 texted me about this case, and this is such an important case. So Tommy, what are we talking about today? Yeah, this is, you know what, this is, uh, and and it is, uh, I'm glad that you said that. I'm really glad that you said that. We didn't talk about that before we got rolling, but I think that there's something to this because uh, I didn't get out yesterday, right? I could have, this is this is a story that um, I could have told a, uh, a while ago and um, a friend of mine and I had talked about it uh, numerous occasions and, uh, and I talked to a couple of people and I never get a good feeling. I'll be really honest. Uh, very often when I do interviews with people, some of the great people, um, that I really, really dig. I just think that it's maybe not quite the venue or whatever, but um, after after doing the interview that we did, I got a lot of feedback from a lot of the people on the lifeboat who just said, um, you know, that vibe is just, there's definitely a, a synergy that I think is more similar here than than in a lot of places that I, that, uh, that I do interviews. And along my way of being incarcerated, I met famous people, a group of them actually. Um, the federal system is kind of odd in that, um, the cases that gain uh, national recognition uh, tend to be to, to be the bigger cases tend to be in the feds very often. So uh, and it's a small system and you get shipped around all over the place. So uh, at one point I got shipped to uh, a yard, um, a medical yard because of a, a problem I have uh, with my my head. I got to some uh, some damage that had been done to the brain. And there was only one yard uh, in the, that side of the country that I could go to. It was a medical facility. Drew Peterson was sent to the same medical facility, and uh, the two of us were uh, were there at the same time. And uh, I got a job as a uh, clerk in the kitchen at this uh, facility, as did Drew Peterson. So the two of us spent over a year, forty hours a week, sitting in a uh, in a room that was about eight by eight with a desk and two chairs. So I spent an awful lot of time talking with uh, with this guy, and if. If you're brand new to Drew Peterson, um, he is a uh, he was a, a police officer who gained some notoriety when um, his much younger wife disappeared. Yeah, and it's yeah. It you was, want me just to it kind was of a, a please? Yeah, let's absolutely. just give a brief background for. I have a lot of viewers, and I thank you for saying that, Tommy. I loved our episode together. We. On this channel, I try to, to, to uh, create a community where we can talk about weird stuff, sometimes controversial stuff. But at the end of the day, it's about like this journey we're all doing and learning from each other. And so I appreciate you saying that. And I do want to say, guys, that Drew does have a daughter out there that Tommy and I have spoken about who um, really, I think, is probably the main motivation for this episode. Um, you know, you don't mess with children. You don't, you know, we want every child that innocence to be prolonged as much as possible for any child and so just a little background you guys um again if you are one of my viewers who is not from the united states you can what there's so many i did a i did a load of research on this just to get my head around it and it's so excuse my language but it's so fucked up this guy is so messed up warning if you have children in the car with you or whoever with you or you're watching you might not this we're going to get into some gruesome topics here so just just fyi but i'm just going to read the first part of just from wikipedia um uh, he is an american convicted murderer uh, from illinois he was a police sergeant who was found guilty in 2012 of the murder of his third wife kathleen 
Savio. A few months after their 2003 divorce, Peterson first received national publicity in 2007 when his fourth wife, Stacy, dis disappeared. Although the police and Stacy Ann's family suspect foul play, she has never been found. Suspicions in Stacy's case were fueled in part by the death of Kathleen, who, who was what landed him in prison, whose bruised body was found in a dried bathtub in her home in 2004 with large gashes on her scalp. Um, they, they found the cause of death to be drowning, but it was a dry bath. I have a lot of questions about this, which hopefully we'll get into the Tommy, because I heard so many different reports of what the murder scene actually looked like. Um, in 2009, in light of Stacy's disappearance, Peterson was indicted for Kathleen's murder after a second autopsy showed evidence of a struggle upon conviction. He was sentenced to 38 years in prison on in 2013. Um, but we talked about this before he started filming. I laugh about this because I'm like the audacity of this man. In 2015, he was charged with two additional felonies, solic sol solicitation of murder and soliciting a murder for hire, attempting to have um, James Glasgow, the estate's attorney handling this prosecution, killed. <laughs> Peterson was convicted in 2016 and was sentenced to additional 40 years. Anyway, he's obviously still in prison. They have here in the United States, what you said, Tommy, they're like two documentaries and there's one movie that's been made about this guy. Like total, yeah, yeah four wives, but we're going to get into it because there's even more grossness to his personal behavior with the age of these women all that kind of stuff. So where do you want to take it from there, Tommy? Well, you know, the uh, the funny thing is, I so um, he had the job before I did, right? And uh, you have to have a job um, at, at these facilities. So uh, I was in where you pick up your um, um, groceries, so to speak, right? <laughs> Once a week, you're able to put in and get a, uh, you know, a bag of, of stuff. And I was waiting in there and I looked over and I knew, you know, I, I recognized him. He's a very recognizable person. And I kind of looked at him and he looked at me the same way. And he came walking up and he goes, I know you from somewhere. <laughs> and I went, I assure you, you don't. You know what I mean? He said, no, I'm pretty sure. I said, look, dude, I know who you are. <laughs> if I had met you somewhere along the way, I would have remembered. I'm like, you're Drew Peterson. Uh, he said, well, you know, don't believe everything that you hear. And I said, well, you know what, Drew, I, I don't much care, you know. But uh, yeah, he said, uh, um, we're looking for uh, a, a second clerk in the kitchen. He said, it's really easy work and it's what's called grade four pay, which was huge money, right? It's like, I think uh, $80 a month, you know, for 40 hours a week, which is pretty big money in there. That's pimping, right? That's big money. So I took the job and uh, I just found out the guy had a really, really dark sense of humor and he joked about his cases a lot. He uh, swears up and down on a stack of, uh, of Bibles that uh, that he's not guilty of any of the things that he's been um, accused of. That said, <laughs> over the course of a long period of time working with him and and uh, watching him decline, you know, he was an older guy and and uh, and he started to slip. And Drew said some things that um, that. I will uh, that we will talk about that that absolutely pointed to what uh, to what happened to his daughter and in, I mean to his uh, his wife rather and uh, you make a key point when I first got out I reached out to uh, uh, to Drew's family and uh, I I had received an email from uh, uh, from his family I wrote back I never received anything back from them I tried really hard because to me that's what this is about that really. really is what this is about is about his uh uh his kid and uh his daughter i think about uh, i think about my own my own child and if i disappeared you know that would be a really tough thing i would uh, it, it would concern me greatly uh, that she worries about uh, whether or not mom just decided to walk off but uh Drew was a cop, right? As you said in the beginning. And when, and when I first met this guy and I first sat down, the, probably the first three or four months, every story he told was about being a, uh, a police officer. And they weren't the kind of stories that you would that someone would highlight if they were trying to talk about how they were uh, the world's greatest cop. Right. right? right. Um, just about everything that this guy did had that, uh, that feel of, um, of larceny to it. Almost, you know, he talked about how he had been um, 
He had been an undercover cop for uh, a long time. He did not come clean to this when, uh, when I was working with him. I didn't realize this until I got out, but he had been bounced out of there for, uh, for suspicion of, he never mentioned any of that when he was in there, probably realizing I couldn't Google it and he could uh, tell, you know, whatever, uh, whatever truth he wanted to. Um, but he joked constantly about, uh, about the, um, the things that he was accused of. And it was, it was a daily part of, of, um, of his life. Drew is hands down the most narcissistic person I've ever met. Um, about once every uh, two weeks, you can go down and get pictures taken, right? And uh, in prison, and you pay for it. It's $2 a picture or whatever. And you would go down and he would be lining up to have his picture taken with 45 people, 50 people, anybody that wanted to pay the two bucks because he's just, to him, he's a celebrity, right? To, to, to him, he's famous. And his, there's nothing in his life that he is happier to do um, then re regale you with all of the great stories about the people that interviewed him. He was, uh, he was on the Howard Stern show and he was on, um, you know, Dr. Phil and he was on, and this is sadly, uh, I think that the narcissism drives this guy to the point where, you know, he's, um, I don't even think he's in touch with reality anymore. Right. I mean, honestly, like I think yeah. it, I think it got to, to that point where he almost started to uh, to believe a lot of his own uh, a lot of his own crap. And uh, and it, it's amusing. I, I hate to say that, but I mean, it's amusing because he, he's a caricature of himself. You know, everybody was out to get him the uh, the prosecution and he would list all of the reasons why the entire thing was BS. But the longer that you knew him, the more that. Um, He'd slip. He'd say stupid things. He would he would say something that contradicted something that you would say earlier. And and in the very beginning, I would just kind of let it slide, you know. Um, but the longer I knew him, I started calling him on it, and I'd start saying stuff like, you know what, I'm not buying it, Drew. So, you know, no hard feelings, uh, you know. But I'm not buying it. I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't believe you. And um, we maintained, I guess, what you would call a friendship, which is really kind of a messed up thing to say, but. You know, you've got to show up every day with somebody for eight hours a day. You know, that's a 40 hour a week gig for a year and a half. Right. Um, but but I will say uh, unequivocally that um, I, I believe and we talked about this the last time that I was on on here. I believe that you can take people in prison and break them into categories. And and very often it's about money. It's just a greed thing that lands people in prison. And it's a, and a small percent, believe it or not, the vast majority are in there for drugs of some kind. Like they need to support a habit or, uh, you know, or they're selling drugs to try to support a habit or, or they're yeah. robbing banks to, to support a habit or whatever the case may be. Drugs are a huge part. Um, and then there's that thin slice that are in there because they're sick. Yeah. They're in there because they're, 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 uh, their wiring is bad. And, and the, you know, the things that these people do, it's, it's like when he described being a cop, Drew never described you know, the good arrest when he went out and did the right thing. He described beating the, the, the piss out of a guy until the guy confessed. It's the you power. Know, like those were the kind of, yeah, the power. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And he's the star of every story. It's, it's incredible. Um, you know, he's, uh, he's bigger than life in his own head, to be sure. Well, that's the funny thing about narcissists. They can be charming, but also very dangerous. And that's, and you're right. My, my therapist told me that like a healthy minded person, when I say a healthy minded person, I basically mean someone who's not a narcissist will never understand the way a psychopath or a narcissist thinks because within every, when you have, when you have, when you are a sold person, you have a soul, you're constantly, whether you're aware of it or not, self self analysis you're, you're watching yourself you you have empathy you're you're even and I, I agree with you tommy i think most people in prison just messed up and they're really good people and they don't really want to hurt anyone and you know it's it's um you know you see that with the moral code of the bad paperwork as you call it for the people who've never been in in prison that's ch ch crimes against children we know that even in prisons that's a no-no like you don't touch a child um you know i, I never or, forget or a woman or what well, i was about to say i never forget um there was there that old show bones i was watching it and she was they had to go into a prison to interview someone and she was very pregnant 
and she just walked in. They're like, where are you going? She's like, they're not going to touch me. Like, I'm a woman and I'm pregnant. Like, I'm, they're, they're not going to touch me, you know? And she was right. And so that shows you with that moral, that there is a moral compass there. So there is that 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 light, that, that spark inside of majority of the people. But when you have people like Drew Peterson, that's just a psychopath that literally gets kicks out of hurting other people, having power over people. And I want to just like back up a little bit because basically what happened now, I believe that he's a serial killer. I think that he not only killed both two, two wives, but um, he's only been convicted of one, but that he's probably hurt other people before. I would not be surprised if there were other people that popped out that were missing that now can be uh, attributed to him, especially with the power he had as being a police officer. So basically, guys, like, so Kathleen, the one woman she was convicted of. Now, I told you, Tommy, I wanted to talk about this to, because some reports said that I was reading and listening to that she was found with a slit in her throat and there was like blood everywhere. But then other reports said that there was no blood. It was asphyxiation, as, as, as that she was strangled and that the, there was nothing in the, like, she was just in the bathtub. Like, it wasn't, it didn't appear that she had even taken a bath. So why would they assume drowning? Did he say, what are your thoughts on that? What do you think actually happened? Well, the reason that they assumed drowning was because Drew Peterson was the first cat there. Oh, I mean, that's honestly, what, yeah, yeah, okay. This was, this was the Bowling uh, Brook Police Department. And I mean, let's keep it real. You, you know, that, that was a case that, when the when they exhumed the body and they took a look at the autopsy the second time they went you got to be kidding right you got to be kidding like this was so obvious you know the with the uh, the position of the bruises her throat was not cut but it was choked she had lig looked like ligature or strangulation uh, marks on the throat and bruises all the way down the side uh what they said would have happened for her to fall and make all of those marks is just it's absolutely impossible you know, it's just impossible. And the fact that they were separate, uh, separated at the time, yet he was still the first person there to, you know, to, to find her. And it was just it. Yeah, it was. Uh, there's really uh, a lot of uh, a lot of reason to be very suspect of uh, of the Bowling uh, Brook Police Department. And it's the reason that uh, his wife, who went missing, was so afraid to go and report this or do any of the you know, she was being. Uh, abused, but she didn't know where to go and, and report this. She knows that that he he's protected, and he's, and, he, and he's telling her that. He's telling her that. Go down to the police department. Tell them whatever you want. Think they're going to do anything? Yeah, I and one you of know? the podcasts I listened to, she one of her friends like went and got coffee with her or something, and she said, "I'm terrified. I'm being followed." And he he said his initial thought was, "Oh, she's just stressed out." But then he saw a cop car drive by and was like, "Holy shit, she's being followed." And so with these wives that we talked about this off camera, I believe that he was a groomer because a lot of these wives were like underage when he met them, especially Stacy. So guys, like after Kathleen died, she was going through the divorce with Drew, um, and then. Stacy, though, in the wings is being or was being groomed. She was 17 when she met him. And um, do we want to speak on that a little bit? Like, like the vulnerability that, she, that where she was in, she came from, a, um, a, according to the reports, her mother also disappeared. And like that, she was born in 1984. She's a year younger than me. Her mother disappeared in 1998. Um, so she did not have a stable childhood, which makes people vulnerable. And I feel like psychotic narcissist pick up on that they see prey absolutely absolutely and, and and the crazy thing is that this is not even a guy that kind of hid that um in his own words and by uh what he told me was that um she was 16 when he met her she had not yet turned 17 when the uh when they met but and and he said and this is of course the woman that he said disappeared this is the mother of his uh of his children but um he said she was trailer trash that, um, you know, he, uh, he basically gave her a life and that's it. I mean, if that's not a quote, that's as close to a quote as I could possibly give you. And that's kind of how he viewed, I think, um, all of the, the, uh, the women that he was with, that he would go find people, like you said, who were extremely vulnerable. Um, and he was that guy that would ride in on the, on the white horse. He was a cop. He was, you know, he had a, he had a job. He was going to come in. He's going to save these people. And, you know, and, and often he not only was a cop, but had a bar. Many times he had a side business that was a bar. And uh, yeah, he just looked like he had it all together until those people, you know, kind of got a look behind the mask.
but yeah. uh, and I and grooming and grooming was something that he did. He definitely looked for women who were a lot younger than he was. It's it when you said that, like my heart sank. The trailer tar snake because we go back to a lot of crimes, especially looking like Jack the Ripper. When when they're dealing with a certain class of people, and I'm not saying this. I I think all human beings that have a soul have a purpose. I don't care what your socioeconomic background is. That doesn't that does not give give you value as a human being but it seems like throughout history we, we see a lot of predators will prey on people that come from lower uh, economic backgrounds because they are looked at as being more disposable you know that people are like the prostitutes that you know that people aren't going to really care they're, they're not going to have stable families you know to to to, to go after if their if their child goes but they're not gonna have the money to hire a private investigator or you know really go to the media and try to you know and so it seems very um tactical in the way that he picked his victims absolutely um in fact what he told me was the first time that he'd ever seen her was when he had been called out uh on a case not not having anything to do with her she was just sort of a, a you know a bystander um, and I don't know whether he exchanged information or whatever, but that led from her going from there down to uh, a bar that uh, was his. So wildly underaged, uh, getting into uh, to a bar, and um, you know, very often these things were happening while Drew had a uh, a wife, and he was grooming. You know, in the process of getting ready to get rid of the last one to get to to the next one that was younger and it was always about in my humble opinion it was about just he is the most narcissistic person i've ever met in my life i mean he's so narcissistic that when you first meet him you think it's a punchline like you think he's got to be kidding you know uh he'll, he's one of those people that will literally refer to himself in the third person from time to time and that's just you know if you do that joking around right tommy skillville doesn't do that but if you did it's kind of funny right but um no he really uh and and he would refer to himself as you know he would talk about his brand and i'm not being funny like he would say you know that this was you know before when, when his brand was at its peak i'm like dude you were you were being followed because they thought you killed your wife this isn't you know you weren't like on the red carpet right right but it, but in his head that's really where he was at He's a pop culture you know? station. And that's, uh, we were saying off camera, like I, I was telling you, I was just watching that Netflix uh, series, uh, Murder Among Mormons. It was the same thing. The guy that did it was like reveling in the fact that he was a, a suspect in, in these deaths. And some a normal person would be mortified if they were, if they were, you know, suspected of doing this horrific thing. And that is the psychopaths love it. They, 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 and as you're, you're talking about him taking the pictures, I'm sitting here thinking like most people get fulfillment with being with their families, you know, their animals, being with friends, you know, working on themselves. And here is, isn't that typical of a narcissist to get the sense of self from the adoration that other people are giving him or the, or what he, or what he views as adoration as just simply being you know, a, a high level, if you will, um, um, case. And just because, I mean, it was high level, probably because he was a cop and because he had, I mean, I'm looking through this too, every single wife that he had complained about domestic violence. All of them Absolutely. Did. All of everyone. them. Uh, everyone. And, and, and he threatened every one of them that I can make this look like an accident. Um, I can get rid of you. I can make it look like, everyone, not one did not get that. And, and the saddest part is that um, his, you know his last wife um she had gone and spoken to to clergy she had gone and talked to a counselor and she had you know she was doing everything right she was in the process of trying to get out of a uh, of a abusive relationship and uh, and she was scared and that's what basically everybody testified to and um sadly it just uh you know it, it the help was uh you know i think the help was there but i think that he uh he put an end to that before that happened no. It's. I, I think I told you, Tommy, when I was listening to one of the podcasts um, to people that knew Stacy, uh, the wife that's still missing. Um, they said that the same thing you said that she was terrified and that she was confiding in people and almost felt hopeless. And it makes me emotional because even one of her friends was like, "It did feel hopeless because he was so powerful in the community." And I think she knew, didn't she? She knew he had killed Kathleen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, and it's how long now has she been technically missing? That's what I was looking for. Um, 
I want to say seven, right? I believe it's since seven um, years. No, since oh seven, if I'm not oh, mistaken. Seven. Oh, what? Yeah, yeah, I think I think check check that and see if I'm wrong. I'm it's looking, a, I'm it's a pull, uh, yeah. Let me pull this up for you guys a, so we can kind of look at this because I'm actually. So this is Stacy, guys. I was. Go ahead. Sorry. I was in, yeah. I was in with him in um, uh, seventeen and eighteen. And he had already been in a long time, so it had been uh, it had been a hot minute. But he, um, yeah, there you go. October oh seven two thousand seven. So she was twenty three. You guys, your brain isn't even finished developing until like twenty five. And so when she was dealing with something. Right. So Peterson was forty nine when he married her. She was nineteen. She should have been out having fun. She was nineteen. Um, she, uh, let's see, Stacy's mother, Christy had previously been reported missing in 1998. Although the two cases are not believed to be linked, um, described as a troubled teenager, Stacy began dating Peterson at age 17 with her father's permission. Now, Tommy, I'm not, I don't want to put you on this by here, but you have a daughter, right? What would do. you do if your 17 year old daughter came home and said, Hey dad, so what he was 47 at the time. I, I met this 47 year old. I think I want to date him. What would you do as a father? Su suffice to say, she would not have gotten my permission. No, I think <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it would have gone well for him either. I mean, and, and the, but the sad thing, once again, though, the sad thing is they look at him, he shows up, he's got on a, he's got on a uniform, right? He's got a hat on, you know, he's a, uh, he's a police officer. He's got, you know, ribbons and they thought, respectable. Hey, you know what? Right. A respectable person. So what if he's, you know, two and a half times her age? I mean, that's just but wild that's, to see that age difference. That's just, oh my God. Yeah. So it says here too, that she actually adopted she adopted Kathleen's children, which is amazing, and treated them like they're on. So that shows you what a good person she was. She was close to completing her nursing degree. So she was trying to, to get her life on track as, as an independent per, uh, person. Um, oh. On, uh, let's see, in the early hours of Monday, October 29th, after her sister Cassandra failed to hear from when expected, uh, Peterson claims that, uh, that Stacy called him at 9 p.m. on Sunday to tell him she had left him for another man. And that she had left her 2002 Pontiac, Pontiac Grand Grand Am at the Bolingbrook's Claw International Airport. Stacy is still considered a missing person. Her family has launched a website to help find her. Um, while talking with Marsha Clark during Marsha Clark investigates the first 48 defense attorney, Joel Brodinski claims to know what happened to Stacy, and he believes that after Drew passes away, Stacy will be found. However, he refuses to elaborate further. So just want to set that scene for you guys. I know we wanted to do this potentially in two episodes, but the gravity of what, I mean, 23, I was doing some dumb shit at 23. Like I was a 23 year old girl <laughs> hanging out with other 23 year olds doing some dumb shit. So it was fun though. Um, right. I mean, the fact <laughs> that she had adopted <laughs> Kathleen's children as well, that's, she took on a lot of responsibility for her age, you know, that, that shows that her Absolutely. willingness to try to her empathy and not to mention the pictures I've seen, all of his wives were beautiful. They were far superior to him in, in the looks department, which doesn't matter, but it just shows you how much, if you're a young 23 or 17 year old, beautiful girl, what do you see in a 47 year old father who's already had like three marriages, you know, that's just a totally different you know, you're starting your life and he's coming towards the middle, you know, over the the middle part of it. It's, it's, it's just, it just shows you how good he was at grooming and potentially how desperate her family was to get her into a good situation, what they thought was a good situation. Um, Absolutely. It's including, fix including fixing her teeth, getting, you know, he, and he would brag about all of the, I won't go through the laundry list because it's super disrespectful, but I will say that, you know, he liked to brag about all of the improvements that he had made to uh, to this young girl after finding her. He is a uh, he is really, really a. Um, well, I can't say enough bad things about the guy. I really can't. But uh, yeah, he he absolutely groomed them. And, and, it, and it was a repeating pattern. It really is. This is not something, you know, this wasn't the first time. Um, and, you know, sadly, he just. Uh, 
you know, he continued to do this, this pattern again and again. And I think often narcissists do once, once the bloom is off, so to speak, and it's not, he's no longer getting the attention for having a girl, a third, his age on, on his arm, you know, even if she's absolutely stunning, all of a sudden, everyone has seen that stunning girl on your arm. How many times now he needs to go to the next. And I think that that's what it was his whole life. It's, it's, um, it, yeah, I was just saying that like that, I, I don't know if you've seen the channel HG Tutor, the the psychopathic narcissist that talks about like he is himself and he talks about it's 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 very helpful because you see how they think. And it's like everything, what did he say? He said with like romantic relationships, and I'm paraphrasing, it's like when they let you down. It's it's always like, and so for someone like Drew, when the aging process starts to happen. Or, you know, we know that Stacy herself had a child, a daughter with him. And so everybody knows when a woman has a baby, her body, it has to change because it has to give life. Now, most men I know expect that and, and think the woman is even more beautiful when she's got the stretch marks because she gave birth to his child, you know, and it bonds them and they both grow old together. And, you know, it's 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 a beautiful friendship and partnership that, that go, you know, you kind of go through life together. But for someone like him... As messed up as it seems, I, I feel like anything that she would do that wasn't beneficial to him was her letting him down. And therefore, he deserved and had the right to remove her, you know. And, right. and um, yeah, I think that's a horrible for a child to believe that their mother just, their mother especially, because mothers, you know, mother, what, what's that saying? A, a woman is, a woman becomes a mother the minute she finds out she's pregnant, a man becomes a father the minute he sees his baby for the first time. There's an intuition with women. And for a child's mother to disappear and to believe that the mother, the person that held you in their body, abandoned you. Um, and that does happen sometimes, but that's got to be a terrible burden to carry. On top of the fact that your father is in prison for convicted of murdering the wife the previous wife which are your half siblings and i know the half siblings are now adults um they are full full grown adults um but we're the the youngest child is definitely a concern um of hers and so tommy is there any that more you want to say i don't know where you want to stop and continue next week with the story what what do you want yeah to well you know here's what i here's what i will say um i will say this that every day working with this guy was um was one joke after another about the fact that um that he killed her literally and 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 it, this was for the benefit of any uh cop nearby any inmate nearby and of course there was a there was a reward involved so he used to, the he used to thrive off making people think that they had a shot of getting you know this reward or doing whatever and anything that this guy could do to keep himself feeling relevant you follow me? Anything he could do, um, you know, if I wanted to drive him nuts, I would just go in there and like write as he talked and just not listen to anything he yeah. said. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, honestly, that that you could drive the man insane. I think solitary confinement would kill him. I really do. He he needs so much for people to um, he wants to be that guy. He, he wants to be uh, to be famous so much. But um, you know what? It probably is not such a, uh, a, a bad place. I will say this. Um, you know, we can, we can tease by saying, absolutely. This man screwed up and told me exactly what happened to his, uh, to his wife. And, uh, we're going to tell you. Well, yeah, we'll do that in part two. It's interesting what you said though, with him kind of teasing the death, it's like, he's still maintaining power over her, even in her death, which is so like fucked up. Like, it's just so like, he's still controlling her. Right. even in death because yep. she she can't her family can't get closure i can't imagine what her friends and family must be going through her sister must be all these years of i i you know i'm not a parent myself but i do have a nephew and two nieces and i think the most horrific thing that could ever happen would it be if something happened to them i don't know even as their aunt i don't know if i would ever recover from that so even if one of them disappeared, I can't imagine my family would ever stop looking. And so, you know, it's it's the fact that this guy, this psychopath can still control the narrative from prison is disgusting. And so it it's not just justice for the daughter, but it's also justice for her and for her family. Um, yep. You know, I, I, I believe her soul probably has 
left and gone on, but we there do, does need to be like an actual laying the body to rest in a respectful way. You know, um, funeral services, whether you're cremated or buried, are always very respectful. And so um, it's a human life that needs to be honored yep. and respected. And so I think it's great we do this in two part, Tommy. So I think this gives our, our audience, again, I know I have a lot of people from overseas that will give them time to kind of look at this themselves, you know? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Because I'll tell you what, you can, this is an onion that you can go really, really deep on. There is so much out there. And may I just suggest that you do everything you can to watch him in his own uh, glory, because you'll see him on Dr. Phil, you'll see him on Dr. Oz, you'll see him on, on Howard Stern. Like he went everywhere. The man thought he was a rock star. He loved it. Um, and he would sit and regale me with the stories of the time he met this famous person or that famous person. And the crazy thing is that Joel Brodsky, his attorney, was getting just as much out of fun out of it as he was. They were quite a pair. That's uh, oh, you're saying all crazy. Camera, most defense attorneys tell you to shut up and go home. Like, <laughs> and like shut up, right? Stop talking. This guy was like, "Hey, I've booked this. I've booked this on the Tonight Show." Right, uh, we're on with Matt Lauer at two thirty. Yeah, I mean most 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 attorneys honestly think his 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 attorney that he should have been disbarred for the things that he did, but he was grooving to it just as much. It was the perfect storm of two personalities that never should have come together. If you look at what they did together, keeping in mind the backdrop of a missing, right? Your your wife is missing. And you really believe she's missing, according to Hoyle, right? Yeah. And you're going on Howard Stern and you're doing, he went on one show and did a, who wants to have win a date with Drew Peterson? For real. They did a deal where they tried to set him up with K Casey Anthony for a date. If you go back and deep oh. dive, like how the circus that this was, and this man was in the middle of it and just loving it. You talk about bad taste. If you go back and look at what, what Drew Peterson was doing while his wife, he had, he, he dated a girl who had no idea anything was going on, who he had in the, uh, in the room trying on his missing wife's bikinis within four weeks, five weeks of her being, you can look all this up. It's all over the How old was The he man ever? is an ace. That's right. I mean, exactly. Young, young girls. Exactly. Young Plenty girls young. Are, they're not watching the news. They're not, you know, aware of the, like, God, this is just so, it's like comical in a disgusting way. You're right. If Absolutely. You, if you want to sell the nation that you are concerned about your missing wife, wouldn't you be out organizing search parties, especially if you're a police officer, to try to find her? Wouldn't you be, right. instead of like advertising yourself? Or trying to go on a date with Casey Anthony? That makes a lot of sense. Right. It's, they, disgusting. Uh, it's disgusting. It's disgusting. It's oh, disgusting. It's so gross. I cannot. And I, I mean, the thing is like we were saying off camera for the, the minor daughter, you know, she's lost both of her parents, but I think in her father's case, it's definitely good that um, I, he's not there. Yeah. And I, I think I saw in one interview that some of his grown, one of his grown sons has actually got custody his of son. her. Yeah. Yeah, and he's an ace by by all accounts. That is a really good human being for real. His uh, his son, thank God, is just a good dude, and has and has you talk about stepped up to the plate. I mean, this uh, he has raised everybody and has yeah. done a, a a a bang up job by all accounts. And we, I tried really tried reaching out. I would have loved to, you know, but says have not been able to make that happen. And this needs to happen. And yeah. I happen to trust you, Bryce. And, We're uh, going to, I'm going to spin this, y'all. Once this is loaded up on YouTube, please share this with everyone possible. I'm going to get all of my other friends who have big YouTube platforms to share this video as well, because this isn't just justice for Stacey. This is also righting the wrongs for an innocent child. And I will say too, Tommy, I was very impressed by the sun. And him having to bear the burden of what his father did, but then stepping up and taking um, accountability for his siblings. And, you know, that just goes to show you, we know that psychopathy can be an inherited issue. Like some, you know, a lot of psychopaths will pass those genes down. But the thing is, is all these women that he had children with all seem to be really good people. And by the grace of God, I think their offsprings, their children got the, the mother's souls. You know, yeah, thank God. 
True Thank story. God. Yep. Thank God. Um, because you're right. I was very impressed by him and his willingness to 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 do hold his head up high and to, and to take on that responsibility. So you guys, um, once again, please share this. I know I'm going to send the footage to Tommy's channel as well because we want to use. That's one thing that's really cool about this timeline is I, we were talking off camera and like nobody trusts the news nowadays. Like everyone's kind of over the news. So we're the news. Like we're we're the uh, we have platforms like YouTube. I'm going to put this on Rumble as well. Like we have all these platforms that we can utilize to our advantage um, to help people out, um, other human beings out. As Ram Dass says, we're all just walking each other home. And, you know, Drew Peterson is where he needs to be. He does not ever need to be let out. He needs to stay there. Um, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. All right, you guys. So be waiting for the part two. After I finish recording, we'll schedule a day to do the part two. Again, please share this for all of my people in Europe. Please share this as well. You never know who has contacts with other people. So just keep spreading the video and let's get this out there and let's get justice for this family. All right, you guys. Any parting words, Tommy, before we sign off for today? No, it's always so much fun to be here, though, Bryce. I really enjoy it. Me too. Me too. All right, you guys. We will talk to a happy Thanksgiving to the Americans this week. But other than that, we will talk to you all soon. Bye, everybody.